This morning we gather on this Pentecost Sunday. As we know, it is 50 days after Resurrection Sunday that we gather for Pentecost. Ten days ago, it was Ascension Day. And it's always an important time for us as God's people together on a Sunday, and especially today. Because I trust that I will challenge you in this message, and unfortunately I have to. Um, I love tradition. There's nothing wrong with tradition. But when tradition and mindsets of tradition starts taking away from the truth of Scripture, unfortunately the South African in me comes out, and I do have to challenge. Because that's what we do. And especially as we deal with Pentecost. Because there are two ways in which people approach the passage, and especially the day of Pentecost. Those who are more from a charismatic uh, persuasion will approach the first 13 verses with absolute excitement to deal with tongues. And those who are more traditional and sort of evangelical will approach the passage and claim it is a birthday party, the birthday of the church. Now, both those aren't wrong because the first 13 verses deal with tongues. And of course, it is the beginning of the church as we look back. But why I want to challenge us this morning is because I don't think we've read the passage. Because if we approach this passage of Acts chapter 2 and we think that it's about tongues or it's about the birth of the church, that's what the text is saying. That's not what the text is saying. That's what people have told us, it says. Because we come to it with a predisposed view or a predisposition to the passage. Want to prove tongues? Very excited. Although normally people from a charismatic persuasion don't like Acts 2 because it speaks about languages and it doesn't fit in with 1 Corinthians 14, which makes it slightly awkward for them. And those who are saying, well, it's the birthday of the church, nothing I read in Acts chapter 2 tells me there were candles. The only candles were on the top of people's heads when they spoke in tongues. I don't see birthday here. And I want to look at the passage, and it's very important to me because I'm not denying that tongues were spoken 100%. I'm not denying that this is the beginning of the church, but I don't think it's the main purpose of the passage. There's a bigger purpose to the passage, and that's why I've entitled the message today, Pentecost, A Call to Repentance. So we're going to read 40 verses, so bear with me, from verse 1 to 40 of Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each one in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they're all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants and maid, my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. 
I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the, de by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he's at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You've made known to me the ways of life. You make me full of joy in your presence." Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And these are the important verses I want us to really focus on. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So just a bit of background, the Feast of Pentecost is a Jewish feast. The Jews have seven feasts. It's Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, and of course then Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles. They have seven feasts. The Feast of Pentecost is a very important feast. It is celebrated 50 days after First Fruits, and that's why it's called the Feast of Pentecost, because Pente is five. It is the Feast of Weeks. Seven times seven plus one gives you 50 days. So on the 50th day after first fruits, Pentecost is celebrated. It's a harvest feast. Two loaves are brought out and there's great celebration of this feast. It is one of the important feasts on the Jewish calendar because it is what is called the traveling feasts. The Jews had to travel for these feasts but they're normally put together in little groups so that you can travel once. So when you travel for Passover, you have Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits together. So you just have to travel once. Then you have to travel for Pentecost. That's a traveling feast. You have to be in Jerusalem for that. And then also you travel for tabernacles, which includes trumpets, uh, atonement, and tabernacles. So this is a very important feast. When you read the context of Acts chapter 2, it makes sense to what happened. That you had Jews who traveled from all over the world to be in Jerusalem for the feast of Pentecost. Jews would be gathered. The text says so. When you look at the text, here from verse, um, from verse 7, 
So when you look at the languages, it lists all the countries, doesn't it? They were amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? Now, what's so funny about Galileans, they're probably the closest to Jewish Geordies you can find. Because their accents were quite strong. Maybe they were like Scousers. Not that I'm the biggest fan of the Scousers, but they had a certain accent. How do I know this? Because when Peter denied the Lord, what did the woman say to him? Your accent gives you away. They could hear that you're a northerner, you're not a southerner. And so look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one our own language? And then it lists the countries, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, most Mesopotamia. It lists all the countries from where all these Jews have come to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. So the first mistake that is made is that Pentecost is a Christian festival. Verse and line, I would love you to find it for me. It's not a Christian festival, it's a Jewish festival. Nowhere does it say it's a Christian festival. Jews gathered for Pentecost. It doesn't say Christians gathered. So firstly, it's a Jewish festival. Then also we have the atmosphere of the time. That the Jews had gathered for Passover, many of them would have stayed in the area for those 50 days because it's too far for them to travel back. They would stay around the area. So there was already an atmosphere. You had the crucifixion of Christ. You had the claim from his followers that he's been raised from the dead. There was this amazing, tangible um, atmosphere in Jerusalem. Something was happening. Jews were gathering. People were talking. People were preaching. Jesus had been crucified. With everything that was happening, all the commotion. So for the Holy Spirit to be given on Pentecost, it was the perfect time, wasn't it? If you're going to reach the most amount of people and most amount of Jews who the promise was given to, when would be the best time? It would be Pentecost. Get all these people together. Everyone knew what was happening. There was this real atmosphere. Jesus had spent 40 days with his disciples. You can read through that in, of course, Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 1, where Jesus had spent 40 days with his disciples, and he told them to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has always been active. Even from Genesis 1, we read of the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit has always been active. But Pentecost was the beginning of a very special ministry, a very special way in which the Holy Spirit would work in this present dispensation jesus christ was to ascend and he gave the holy spirit and the holy spirit has a work to do and a very specific ministry that especially john chapter 16 speaks of of convicting the world of sin of teaching us truth so this was that appointed time and i wrote this in my notes and i really want us to try and remember this because again it's just my little issue i get, i get worked up about this it might not be that big of an issue but I really struggle with Pentecostal prayer meetings. I really do. I don't know why people pray for Pentecost. What are you doing? Do we have um, crucifixion prayer meetings? Where we pray for the crucifixion to happen again? The crucifixion was an event, not so. Once off. Pentecost was a once off event. I don't understand why churches would gather for a week to pray for another Pentecost. What? It was the appointed time for the Holy Spirit to come. If the Holy Spirit then comes again, it didn't come. He's come. So again, it's ignorance. It's all it is. It's not a lack of sincerity. It's sincere. But what are we praying for? Praying for the Holy Spirit to come again? He's come. It's also another insult when we gather in church service saying that we wish the Holy Spirit would come. What? He's here in us. He dwells in us. Your presence is the Holy Spirit because he lives within us. All these little terms that people think are cute, but they're not biblical. They're not sound biblically. So therefore... There is something special about Pentecost, and it was a very special time, but it was a unique once-off event, never to be repeated again. Even in the book of Acts, when Peter speaks of the Holy Spirit's work, he refers them back to Pentecost. Do you remember when he came? You can read about that in Acts chapter 15. And so when we read the passage, we have to see that it's a very specific and unique time. So I'm going to try and work through the passage. We're going to break it up in little chunks. I don't want to focus on the tongues issue. That's not the purpose of, of the talk. I'm just going to mention it briefly to just give you some insight to it, but it's not the main focal point of what I want to share. So when you look at verse 1 to 13, we have the tongues that are spoken. Now, it's very clear from the text. I'm not inserting into the text. Neither am I trying to be funny with the text. I think all of us would agree when you read the text, 
that what is spoken here are known human languages. Also, how is it that we hear each one speak in our own language in which we were born? Because the Jews that were there were traveling Jews. So you had Jews born in Greece and Jews born in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. You'd have Jews born in Iraq and they were coming to Jerusalem for the feast. They didn't speak Hebrew. It wasn't their national, their sort of born language to speak Hebrew. They grew up in nations that normally spoke either Greek or other languages. And now suddenly they're coming to Jerusalem and they're meeting up with Jews who live in Jerusalem and, and, and Israel who only speak Aramaic or speak, some of them might be able to speak Hebrew, but normally Aramaic. They don't speak these foreign languages. Suddenly the Holy Spirit comes and suddenly these men and women, the 70 or the 120 in, in the upper room, were able to now speak in known languages of the people in the countries they came from. It's not inserting into the text what the text is saying. So when the Bible here speaks of tongues, it is a known language. And there's a very important purpose to why God did this. Firstly, it was a sign that something special was happening. I would ask you to think through this because it's, it's quite interesting. It's not actually technically biblical. I can't give you verse in line. However, many Jews believe that it was on Pentecost that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was given. So Moses was given the commandments on Pentecost. And when you read in Exodus from sort of 20, 28 to 32, what you had, there, you had the mountain, you had the rumblings, you had the fire, you had 3,000 that died. When you look at the text here, we have fire, you have noise, and how many were saved on the day of Pentecost? 3,000. Now again, I'm not saying it's biblical, I'm just saying it's interesting. But you had the sign of the Holy Spirit. You had the noise. You had the wind. What, why, why wind? What is the word for spirit? It's wind. So the Holy Spirit's always connected to wind and to that noise and to fire. So that's why you had these signs. And so when the Holy Spirit comes, he gives the ability to all those in the upper room to speak in these languages. What was the Great Commission? Go into all the world and preach the gospel how is the gospel going to reach the world the gospel was going to reach the world through these people actually hearing the gospel in their own language and then they return to their countries and what do they do when they go there they tell people about jesus so it's amazing so all these people here are hearing the the uh, disciples speaking in their own languages and through this the message of christ would reach the world that's the purpose of tongues in this context, yeah. It's to reach the world. And the best way was that those who heard could hear in their own language this wonderful miracle. So that's one part of Pentecost, was to reach the world with this message. If God was going to create momentum for the gospel to go out you had the most amount of people that knew the old testament the most amount of people that maybe were there at the crucif cruci crucifixion of christ the most amount of people that had some knowledge and contact and for the message to go out the best thing to do is use an already ready-made workforce to take the message out and that's what happened but then we get to verse 14 to 21 and this is where Again, I highlight to me what the importance of Pentecost really is. Because Peter says, and Peter standing up with the 11, why the 11? What happened to Judas? Gone. But as you know, in Acts chapter 1, Judas was replaced by Matthias. So it actually is the 12. But it literally, I think it's more got to do with Peter and then the 11. They raised, raised his voice and said to the men of... Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. And then he goes through a very interesting prophecy. Has anyone ever asked the question why he speaks about this prophecy? I don't know if you've ever read Joel chapter 2. Now I say that not to a sort of, oh, why? You haven't read Joel chapter 2? I don't really generally read Joel chapter 2 until I preach a sermon to go and read Joel chapter 2. So it's not an no issue with that. But I read Joel chapter 2. If you've read Joel chapter 2, it's, the whole passage is about the second coming. What is the second coming generally? The beginning of the world or the end of it? 
I know it's quite a tough one. I know everyone's like, I know it's tough. It's the beginning of the end. It's the end. So why is Peter quoting something that is the end if it's supposed to be the beginning of something? I know it's, it's difficult. I know. I ask those questions as well. But what happens if people come to the passage and immediately it's like it's the beginning of the church, but everything about what he's quoting is the end of the world. I don't know for you, but if the sun being darkened and the moon turning to blood doesn't sound great, does it? When I read the book of Revelation, I suddenly see the sun being darkened and the moon turned to blood in Revelation as well, don't you? And why I'm just raising this, I might not have the full answer to those questions, but I just think that when we approach the text, we need to be slightly more focused on what it's saying rather than what someone else told me. Because someone else told us it's a birthday party. When I read the text, I don't read birthday party. I don't go to, my, go to Harry's birthday party going, you know what? The sun's going to be dark and the moon's going to turn to blood before the terrible day of the Lord. Happy birthday. So I believe Peter's quoting Joel's prophecy because Joel's prophecy has a very specific aspect to it. Now, again, theologically, I don't know where everyone's at, but I have to speak from what I believe the scriptures teach. And the scriptures teach clearly, according to Romans 11, that before Jesus Christ returns, what's going to happen to Israel? Life from the dead. Romans 11 speaks about that before Christ returns, Israel will receive life. What does Ezekiel 37 speak about? It speaks about the dry bones that will live. So before Jesus returns, there will be a remnant in Israel saved to enter into the kingdom as God's priests, according to um, Exodus 19, verse 6. So why does Peter quote Joel? Because he's saying that what is happening on the day of Pentecost is the beginning of the revival of God's Jewish nation there. That suddenly the Spirit is come, and it's like Ezekiel 37, because now suddenly there is life in Israel, spiritual life. And he's encouraging them because he says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. What Joel was saying is that before Christ returns, there's going to be life in Israel. So that's why he quotes that. And that's why I've entitled the message, A Call to Repentance, because he's speaking to a very specific group of people. So the focus here in these seven ver or eight verses is specifically on renewal in Israel and the promise of blessing to Israel. If you read uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 34, it speaks of the new covenant. Behold, I make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and I will put my spirit in them, and they will walk in my statutes. Life in Israel. Hold on to that. And then Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 to 32. I don't know, Jim, have you got that? I didn't give you that, did I? Did I? Oh, I just jumped across. On the draw. You guys are in safe hands with a pilot, Jim. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. All right. You turn with me to Ezekiel 36. And just listen to these words. Because you've got Jeremiah, which is the one that most people know. But Ezekiel 36, we often don't know. And I give another little thought to you. When you read John chapter 3, and Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, and he says to him, you're a teacher of the law, and you don't know about rebirth. You should know these things. What was Jesus referring to? Where in the Old Testament does it speak of rebirth and renewal? Where? In Ezekiel 36. So when Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, and he speaks about spiritual life and being born again, Nicodemus should know that that is what the Old Testament predicted, that Israel will have life. New birth. So let's look at verse 25 to 32, and it says... Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. I just want to stop it there. Is he speaking to an individual? Is Ezekiel speaking to an individual or a group of people? Not speaking to an individual yeah. he's speaking to a group of people. The same as what Peter is doing in, in Acts chapter 2. He's not, a one in, he's not sharing the gospel with one person, saying to him that God's going to give you this new heart. He's saying to the whole of the nation, then you shall dwell in the land that I'll give your fathers. There we go. What land is that? Not Marlow. 
that I, and you shall dwell in the land that I will give your give you give to you gave to your fathers you shall be my people and I will be your God I will deliver you from all your uncleanness and I will call for the grain and multiply grain very interesting what's Pentecost it's a, it's a harvest feast it's a nice, nice little connection there. And multiply and bring no famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of your trees and increase of your fields so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. Then you shall remember your, then, then you will be, remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I want you please to hold on to verse 31. When we get to verse 37, 38, and 39. Um, is everyone with me that he's speaking to Israel here? Okay, because he's speaking about land, he's speaking about bringing, so it's pretty clear. But verse 31, you will loathe yourselves in your own sight. Verse 32, not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord God, let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. So when we go back to Acts chapter 2, And Peter stands up and he gives this discourse here of the, of the prophecy of Joel, which is there. Look at verse 22. Men of? Men of Israel. Who is he speaking to? Israel. In the context of Ezekiel 36 and this renewal that's supposed to take place in Israel, part of God's prophecy, in a comparison to Jeremiah, all I'm just driving home here is asking, are we looking at the immediate context? Are we just coming to this thinking it's the beginning of the church? That's all it is. Nothing here at the moment speaks to me of church. It speaks of renewal in Israel. Let's look at verse 22 onward. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. So from verse 22 to 36, Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Look, um, look here at verse... Look at verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Whose throne is that? The throne of David. So Peter here from verse 22 to 36 declares that Jesus is the Messiah, Israel's Messiah. It is through his death and his resurrection that God proved that he is the Messiah. And once again, a highlight, very important in verse 22, men of Israel, look at verse 23. And just the terminology again. Because what happens is, um, I don't know if you know history, but Martin Luther despised the Jews. He did. <laughs> Martin Luther hated Jews. He called them dogs. And the reason why was because he believed that they crucified the Messiah. And then people that are very much focused on Israel's future, and shall I say pro-Israel, which, which I am, we get super defensive. But yes, because Martin Luther's theology in other areas was off. But he wasn't wrong. I remember once sitting ignorantly, sitting at someone's house, and they had a little pamphlet from Jews for Jesus. And in there, it basically said sort of, you know, we, we still get attacked for, for crucifying the Messiah. And I said, yes, you did. It's a fact of Scripture. This is not anti-Semitism. It's biblical. Look at verse 23. And that's why it's a call to repentance. Bear with me. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Um, who's taken? What does it say there? You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. He's blaming all those at Pentecost who are there. He's saying that you as a nation, collectively, you have crucified the Messiah. But it's, been part, it's part of God's purpose. 
And another interesting thought, if you ever want to explain the sovereignty of God, the best example is the cross. God holds people accountable for crucifying the Messiah, yet it was part of God's eternal purpose. Explain that to me. But here he's blaming them for crucifying the Messiah, but yet it's part of God's purpose. Verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So Peter, in his sermon here on the day of Pentecost, is clearly driving home to these Jewish hearers. And don't be mistaken, there were no non-Jews here. The only people that grew up non-Jewish were the proselytes who became Jews. You don't just waltz into Jerusalem as someone that enjoys a pork butty. That was quite funny, I thought, but it's a tough crowd. I know. But you don't just waltz into Jerusalem going into the quarter where the Jews are if you are a Gentile. Do a bit of reading later on in the book of Acts. The, Paul the Apostle, they, they basically cause a riot in Jerusalem because they say that Paul the Apostle took a Gentile into the temple area. You would have madness. So the people that are hanging around you are not non-Jews, they are Jews. And Peter's driving home the fact that they have crucified their Messiah. They have. Look at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, just so that they know that he's not just talking about one verse, it's two. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ quite interesting on the day of pentecost part of the process is that they would have two loaves out and many people have the view that the two loaves that are brought out during pentecost is for jew and gentile can i again reiterate the fact that gentiles aren't allowed near the temple area they have their own little area do you think that in the old testament that would rep they, that, that would represent a gentile why two loaves in the book of Ezekiel, it speaks about the sticks, two sticks coming together. Because Israel was divided into Israel and Judah. Look at verse 36. Let the whole house of Israel know. Because the two loaves represent the two houses coming together. It's the whole house of Israel. And here's the crux for us, the repentance part. Let's look at verse 37. We're going to go through to 40, and then it's going to make sense, I hope. So now... The Jews are hearing in their own tongues. Peter goes into the sermon speaking about Joel and this renewal that needs to take place before Christ returns. He then takes them on a guilt trip because they've crucified the Messiah collectively. And then let's look at verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. What is the work of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16? What will he do to the world? He will convict the world of? Sin. It's quite interesting. The Holy Spirit's just come, and it says that they were cut to the heart. Now, Jim, I know that you are the pilot. It was in my thinking, but I didn't put it in. Could you maybe quickly find Acts chapter 7, verse 51 to 53? We're going to talk, we're going to continue to talk while Jim is just guiding us. We're just flying over. Don't be concerned, ladies and gentlemen. We might have some turbulence, but it will be okay. But let's look at verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We have now crucified our Messiah. We recognize we've crucified the Messiah. We recognize this evil we have done. Now we ask men, what shall we do? Turn with me to Acts chapter 7, verse 51 to 53. Jim, if you can please put 54 there. Sorry, 54 is the one I actually want. 51 to 54. Listen to this, these wording. In Acts chapter 7, Pete, uh, sort of uh, Stephen, sorry, Stephen is preaching now to the Jews. And after he's preached this long sermon, longer than I preach generally, he gets to verse 51. He says, you stiff-necked 
and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Okay? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. Can you imagine saying to a Jew that you're uncircumcised? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. You have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. And look at verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. So when you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. So those at Pentecost were cut to the heart. Those that wanted now to kill Stephen were cut to the heart. But when you read on in Acts chapter 7, what's the response? And they gnashed at him their teeth. And as you read on, what do they do with Stephen? They stone him to death. What is the response at Pentecost? Go back to Acts chapter 2. Thank you, Jim, for that. So Acts 2, 37, and let's look at verse 38. So men, they were cut to the heart, and they asked Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38, then Peter said to them, what must you not do? You must repent. Of what? Because this verse, people love using this verse. How must I be saved? Well, the Bible's clear. Just repent and be baptized. Isn't it so? Is that what that verse is? Repent and be baptized? What's the context? What must they repent of? What did they do? What have they just done? And what must they repent of? Must they repent of their sins, of lying, of cheating, of stealing? Is that what he's saying? No. The repentance here is to the whole group of them. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When they ask men and brethren, what shall we do? What is he referring to? Let's go back. When we go to verse 23 and 36, you have crucified your Messiah. They stand there. They've crucified their Messiah. They now realize they've crucified the Messiah. And they ask, what shall we do? And Peter says, for this sin, collectively, you must repent. Collectively, as a people, you must repent and be baptized, immersed now into the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse 39. For this promise, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Who is the perverse generation? So when the Pharisees came to Jesus, Jesus saw them and he said, A wicked and perverse nation seeketh after signs, and no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah. Who is the generation he's referring to here? Is he talking about the world, non-Jews and Jews together as this generation? Or is he specifically focused on the Jewish generation alive at the time? Jesus said, this wicked and perverse generation. Because verse 39 and 40 is Peter calling the Jews out from the corruption of Judaism. He's calling them out saying, repent from that and come to Christ. And the remnant will be called out of Israel and make up the true believing Israel. And that's why he speaks about the generation here, because verse 39 is misread. People think that verse 39 is saying that this promise is to you and your children and to all the Gentiles afar off. No, it's not what it's saying. When it says to those afar off, it's speaking about the Jews that are afar off. That's who the promise is for, because God is calling out those who truly believe out of Israel, out of the world, because Israel will make up this thrust to reach the world with the gospel. So again, people can insert into these verses things that are not there. So Peter calls Israel to repentance from verse 37 to 40. We see in verse 37, they're convicted of their sin. Because in verse 36, it says they crucified their Messiah. 
Do we remember those chilling words? I think that's the most chilling words I've ever heard. When you, if you've ever watched The Passion of the Christ, it's in there and it's quite chilling. So Jesus is there and Pilate is there and Pilate wants to let Jesus go. Because he knows Jesus is innocent. He wants to let him go. But the people are shouting and it's Barabbas and they want Barabbas released. And the people are shouting, crucify him. And that's the, the, the picture again of what we have of, of, of Palm Sunday in comparison to, to Good Friday. I mean, on, uh, sort of five days, or five days ago, the streets of Jerusalem they sung for him, didn't they? Hosanna, Hosanna. And then five days later, the streets of Jerusalem is saying, crucify him, crucify him. And you have Barabbas there that you know, looks like a real criminal. Probably has a tattoo that says mom. Anchor on this side. <laughs> Just make, looks like Popeye. He's there. Got perfect Jesus here. And the crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And then Pilate's like, but I'm innocent. This man's innocent. And he washes his hands. And what does the crowd shout? Let his blood be on us and our children. They made that statement. Then Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And where do we see the forgiveness? We see the forgiveness in Peter's sermon. That Peter now is given the platform to preach the very same people who were there. And he preaches a message of forgiveness to them. And he says to them, yes, you have crucified the Messiah. And what this is speaking about is as a nation, it's judicial. That's how God sees them. It doesn't matter if you were in Turkey at the time having, I don't know, kebabs i don't know and now you're in jerusalem doesn't matter because you are of israel you're part of the same stock and he's speaking to them as a collective saying to them as a nation you've rejected your messiah but he is gracious he is loving he is god and he is here for you so yes you've crucified him but there's hope and they say what must we do and that's when peter says you can repent and be baptized and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and be incorporated into the something special and something new that you don't fully understand now, but that will be developed going on and going forward. And therefore, verse 38 is a very specific verse, which is very different from Acts chapter 16, verse 31, when the Philippian jailer is in the jail and the doors are opened and, and, and Paul and Silas are about to leave, he thinks, and he falls to his knees thinking that he's going to die. And he shouts and Paul says, don't worry, we're still here. And the Philippian jailer says to Paul, what must I do to be saved? Paul doesn't say repent and be baptized. Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Because the call here to repentance is very specific to a group that is accused of something very specific. This is not repent of all your little sins. The call here is for specific repentance as a group for crucifying the Messiah. And then verse 39, again, this promise is to you and to your children and to those who are far off. And I believe that he's speaking of a specific remnant So as we conclude, when we look at this going, so basically when I read the New Testament looking back, we see something was starting. The church starts unfolding, yes. But we see that looking back. It's like, who's seen those movies? I think movies like The Sixth Sense or other movies where you know the end. Have you, has someone told you that? Have you had that movies with a, tw a plot twist at the end and someone tells you before you go and watch the movie? And you're like, oh, the guy's actually dead. We know that. And so the church, we understand the church starting in Acts chapter 2. We see the development of that. But they didn't know this. We see this looking back. But at no point in this passage is it saying this is sort of like a revival of church or in the beginning of church. No, this is a specific sermon that is preached to a very specific people for them to repent and to turn to Christ. So it's specific. And therefore, we need to know what our specific call is. 
Because if I stand in front of a group of non-Jews and Gentiles out in funny places, whether that's in London or Maidenhead, because there's no funny people in Marlow, so I'm using Maidenhead and Wickham. It's a joke. Maybe pub in the park, I'll do that, pub in the park. I don't go to pub in the park and ask for the mic. So Paloma Faith is singing thing tonight. I'm going to say, Paloma, just give me the mic. And I shout to everyone at, at the pub in the park, you must repent and be baptized. Of what? Of what? There's no other call in the New Testament. Please find it to me where Paul the Apostle goes to anyone else and says to the group of people, repent and be baptized. It doesn't say that. It's a very specific passage. So what is our gospel call? Our gospel call is very simple according to 1 Corinthians 15. And that is that Jesus died and rose again and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And then we baptize you. But it's not the general gospel call that we see here. And now in the same way, as the New Testament starts developing, we see that Jesus Christ is using us as Christians, not for a specific gospel call here to the Jews that you have in Acts 2, but he's using us according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to go out to the world and preach a message, not that they have crucified the Messiah. I don't go to the streets of, I don't go to Oxford Street and stand outside Oxford Street, maybe the big M&S there. And when people walk in, I say to them, you must repent because you've crucified the Messiah. They haven't crucified the Messiah per se. Gentiles are not responsible in the Bible for crucifying the Messiah, but Gentiles are responsible for worshiping trees. Yes. You might not believe that, but if I go back to your history, your forebears were dancing around Stonehenge like anyone's business. Because the accusation against the non-Jew is Romans 1. We have rejected the creator and worshiped the creature. And what we must repent of is repent of rejecting God. Yes. If you want to be specific about the law, don't worry about lying. Worry about the first two because we have made graven images as Gentiles and worship those things. Because the call to repentance is specific to who you're dealing with. And so today, God has called us not to go around shouting at people about repenting. Please, I don't have a cardboard cutout saying the end is nigh and repent. That's weird. Our responsibility is very clear, and that is to share a message not of hatred, not of Oh, judgment, the message of the Christian and the cross is a message of reconciliation, that man can be reconciled back to God. 2 Corinthians 5 from 17 to 21. So my call is to a lost world to say, yes, you've worshipped trees. Yes, you worship yourself. And yes, you've got to turn your to turn and, and, and turn your mind and change your mind from that. So repent from that stuff. But guess what? God is holding out his hand as a, me as a message of reconciliation. You can be reconciled to a holy God, even though you are not. And all of that comes to a head in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are not calling men, non-gender terms. I'm not even going to correct that. We're not calling men to repent for crucifying the Messiah. When we speak to the Gentile world, we speak to them, about their paganism, about their worshipping of self, about their rejecting God. That's our calling. So when we look at Pentecost, I want us to read the text and see the call of repentance at Pentecost, which is very specific. It's very specific for then and for that time. And we draw from it. Yes, of course. But it's very specific. And you see this unfold in Acts chapter 3 and 4 and 5, that it builds momentum to the church actually starting to fulfill its purpose. But it all starts at Pentecost to firstly a call of repentance to those who are there. So my concern is, if we don't understand that, that many people can use verses in the Bible but use it incorrectly, and God is merciful and He's okay with it, but please let us not does not think that it's okay when we know the truth and we choose to do our own thing. So please don't use Bible verses and scripture either incorrectly or irresponsibly because it's not the truth. I want to know what the truth is, not what people are telling me. And therefore, 
It's important for us to see Pentecost as the time of the Holy Spirit that He came. It's the once that He came, and now He's with us. It was a call to repentance to those who knew Jesus was crucified. Specifically, that was that time for them. And so that develops as we see the New Testament unfolds. And therefore, we celebrate what Pentecost is, that the Holy Spirit has come and God was starting a new work. And we're excited about that, but we need to understand where this fits in for us today. And that our call is very specific. It's a message of reconciliation. It's a message that God has called us to call others to receive. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you, Lord, for the power of this important passage. And thank you, Lord, that we can be together. We can hear your word today. And we pray that you'll help us to understand your word, understand where things fit in, so that you can help us and inspire us to share the gospel. Help us, Lord, to share that message of reconciliation with all those we meet. Thank you, Lord, for saving so many on the day of Pentecost and after. Thank you, Lord, for the foundation of the church that was laid in those times. Many Jews who had come to faith were part of you reaching the world. And we thank you for that as we even read about that in Acts chapter 11 and onward. So we thank you for that. And then we thank you, Lord, for how you in your sovereign plan, start incorporating many Gentiles so that the church is what it is, both Jew and Gentile today. But it's all part of your plan, and we thank you for that. So, Father, we just pray that you'll help us to share the message of reconciliation, message of your grace, the great message of your mercy to a lost Gentile world. Help us, Lord, and use us. In your wonderful name we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please stand for our concluding song.